I have received a letter from the Honourable Leader of the Opposition proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the urgent need for a clear and unified plan to deliver a stronger Australia and a better future. And I call on those honourable members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places. And I, and I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, thanks uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, momentous uh, events have taken place. No, the, I've, called, I've, I've called the Leader of the Opposition. Well, bad luck. No, no, I've, I think we've moved to the matter of public importance. I've called the Leader of the Opposition and I've been watching the Leader of Government, the Deputy Prime Minister, who has not indicated that we are having any other business before the MPI. So the Deputy Prime Deputy, Yes, the Deputy sorry. The Leader of the Opposition has the call on last for the clocks to be reset. Thanks, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, this parliament over the last 24 hours has witnessed some dramatic events. A Prime Minister has been dragged down for the second time in three years, and one third of the Cabinet has resigned. I say that the people of Australia and this parliament deserve a full explanation as to why that was deemed necessary yeah. by the current Prime Minister. But what we've had, Mr. <coughs> Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is not a word, not a skerrick of the explanation that the people of Australia are owed. The uh, now Prime Minister has given no interviews, he's held no press conference, and he answered no questions, uh, no questions whatsoever on this subject in the parliament in question time today. And the man who has been plotting for three years, for three long years, to bring down uh, his predecessor as Prime Minister is now saying, nothing to see here, yeah, nothing on. to see here, move on, move on, nothing to see, like St Francis of Assisi. Uh, the Prime Minister is innocent of this blood on his hands. Like Pontius Pilate, uh, the Prime Minister is washing the blood off his hands. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's just not good enough. It's just not good enough if the economy is as good uh, as the Prime Minister claimed in question time today. Why do we no longer have the Treasurer who was managing it? Uh, if the government and the country is in as good shape as the Prime Minister claimed in question time today, why was it absolutely necessary to drag down the Prime Minister who has led the government for three years and three days. The Prime Minister owes the country, he owes the parliament an explanation. He obviously hasn't forgotten the events of three years uh, and three days ago. The people haven't forgotten the intervening period. We know how this government has struggled uh, from division to disaster, and the Prime Minister needs to explain why it is that he felt it necessary to drag down this country's first female Prime Minister. Why was it necessary to do this? He owes us an answer, and I trust, I so trust, Mr Deputy Speaker, that he will come into this parliament and respond to the MPI today sure. and give us the answers that this parliament and the people of Australia deserve. And if he doesn't, I trust that he will not be able to go anywhere involving the media of this country without him being subjected to the questioning that he deserves to face on this subject. Because the truth, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that after the events of last night, this Prime Minister's hands are just as dirty as those of his predecessor. That is the truth, but at least his predecessor had the decency the honour and the courage to offer an explanation. Here, here. It wasn't a very good explanation. She said back then on the 24th of June that a good government had lost its way. We know it wasn't true. Uh, we know it was a bad government that lost its way because she subsequently told us why won't this Prime Minister at least have the honour that his predecessor had 
and offer an explanation to the Australian people. It's not too much to ask. It's not too much to ask. 24 hours ago, we had one Prime Minister. Now we've got a different Prime Minister. Why has this been done? Why has this been done? He owes us an order, explanation. Order, and order. on behalf of the Australian people, while he's, while he's going about it, order. on behalf of the Australian people, uh, I pose Member two questions. I pose Those two questions uh, the to the incoming of the opposition Prime to be Minister. Heard. First and most importantly, when will the election be? When will the election be? Yes, it is the prerogative of the Prime Minister. The previous Prime Minister told us the date, uh, and given that she had the courage and the decency to tell us the date, why won't her successor have equal courage and decency and tell us what the date is? End the uncertainty. End the uncertainty that the events of last night have created, and at the very least confirm the date previously mentioned. And while he's answering some questions, he ought to also tell us what is going to happen to the carbon tax increase on Monday. Yeah. These are the material facts which the Prime Minister ought to come clean with the Australian people about what is the date of the election and what is happening to the increase in the carbon tax due next Monday. But there is a larger question which he ought to address. How is Rudd recycled going to be different from Rudd rejected previously by his colleagues. Now I know the Prime Minister will say, oh, there's the Leader of the Opposition uh, being negative again. These are legitimate questions. And just because he wants the people to have amnesia about the past, we should not accede to that self-serving request. We need to know why the person who said before the 2007 election that the reckless spending must stop then presided over the greatest spendathon in Australia's history. We need to know why the Prime Minister, who said he would turn boats around, didn't turn a single boat around and instead uh, began the greatest border protection disaster in Australia's history. We need to know why a Prime Minister who said that climate change wasn't just important, wasn't just one issue, but was in fact the greatest economic, social, political and moral challenge of our generation then dumped the emissions trading scheme policy uh, which he had previously said was so vital. We need to know why a Prime Minister who originally said he'd fix the national broadband network for $4.7 billion then said, no, that's not going to work. We've got to spend $44 billion on it, and now it seems it's going to cost $96 billion dollars, uh, at least $60 billion more than it should. Uh, the Prime Minister who said he was going to fix fuel and grocery prices and then abolished fuel watch and grocery watch needs to give us an explanation. The Prime Minister who said he'd deliver 263 childcare centres to end the double drop—remember the double drop, the dreaded double drop—he gave us 38. Why, Prime Minister? The Prime Minister who said he'd give us 2,600 trades training centres uh, and actually delivered less than 10 per cent. He needs to explain to the Australian people how someone who was so inadequate and incompetent then that he was rejected by his own parliamentary team uh, can somehow justify regaining the prime ministership. He said he'd insulate a million roofs. And instead, he started more than 200 fires in people's houses. He said he'd begin an education revolution, and instead, uh, he spent, uh, wasted, uh, overspent some $8 billion on overpriced school halls. Uh, he said he'd fix public hospitals and he'd have a referendum on this if they weren't fixed by 2009. Well, I've got to say, public hospitals are in a better state today. All thanks to coalition state governments, and no thanks uh, to the uh, incoming prime minister. Member for Wakefield. I know, I know the prime minister wishes to gloss over previous failures. I know the prime minister 
wishes to say that this is uh, ground zero, the clock starts from now, but the Australian people aren't mugs. We remember we don't have amnesia, and we understand that people who are submitting themselves to the judgment of the Australian people will be judged on their deeds, not on their words. This is a Prime Minister who cannot run on his record. The government can't run on the record of its first term because it dumped Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister. And the government can't run on its record in its second term because it has just dumped Julia Gillard as Prime Minister. How is it, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that a Prime Minister who was chaotic and dysfunctional uh, in office can suddenly be a Prime Minister of due process? He needs to explain how this can be. But I have to say the auguries are not good. They are not good. He was 45 minutes late for his first press conference, the press conference at which he didn't answer any questions. He said last night that he wanted to end the negativity, and then all he could do was attack uh, the opposition and its leader. Well, I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the point of being in this parliament is not to stop someone, it's to start something. And what we on this side of the House want to start is a better government, a stronger economy and a prouder and more confident Australia. That's what we want to start and that's what will happen if there is a change of government whenever the election is held. There is a clear choice, Mr Deputy Speaker, between members on this side of the parliament and those opposite. Those opposite, they can't help themselves. They believe in big government. We on this side support strong citizens. Members opposite can't help themselves. They're obsessed with wealth redistribution. We believe passionately in wealth creation. Yeah. Members opposite put their trust in officials. They can't help themselves. We put our trust in the strong individuals that compose Australia's society. They believe in the state. We trust the communities of this country. We want to build up the social fabric not just build up ever bigger, ever more intrusive government. Yeah, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, the people of Australia know exactly what they will get from the coalition. We will stop the boats, we will scrap the carbon tax and the mining tax, we will put the budget back into the black. But we understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the families, the households of Australia are doing it tough. That's why, under the coalition, they will get to keep their tax cuts and their pension and benefit increases without a carbon tax. Yeah, yeah. That means that every Australian household's budgetary position at the end of the week or the fortnight or the month should be so much stronger. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not just about building a richer society. It's about building a better society as well. We know that the Australian people yearn to be their best selves. And that's why, Mr Deputy Speaker, should there be a change of government, there will be a much greater engagement between this parliament and, its go and the government of our country and the Indigenous people of Australia. We know that the problem in Indigenous policy over the last generation has not been underinvestment so much as under-engagement. And that's why, should there be a change of government, I will spend at least a week every year as a volunteer in a remote Indigenous community, because if it's good enough for Australians to live somewhere, it's good enough for the Prime Minister and senior officials to stay there. And it's on this basis that we will pursue the real reconciliation that will make our country whole. It's fortified and informed by this that we will pursue the constitutional recognition uh, which will rectify our foundation document. We won't so much change our constitution as complete it. We want a fair income paid parental leave scheme because we think that the women of Australia deserve a fair go. They deserve a fair choice to have a career and a family at the same time, and we will give it to them. And I am proud, I am proud 
that the first political party to offer a fair dinkum paid parental leave scheme that pays people their real wage and not a welfare wage uh, while they're on parental leave will be the coalition that I lead. Yeah. Yeah. We won't neglect the environment. Not only will we cut emissions with incentives, not penalties, we will send a permanent standing Green Army, 15,000 strong, to the rescue uh, of our remnant bushland and our degraded waterways. Here, here. Mr Deputy Speaker, this has been a low and dishonourable parliament in many respects. And last night, the Prime Ministership was debased yet again to be traded uh, by the faceless men rather than decided uh, by the Australian people as it should be. The Australian people should control the Prime Ministership and the government of this country. That's why, Prime Minister, you shouldn't run away. You should name the date. Name the date. Or, Tell or, us uh, when it will be. Leader opposition, time has expired. I, I call the Prime Minister. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and I welcome this opportunity to speak in this matter of public importance. Um, and um, I uh, note that the matter of public importance refers to a positive plan for Australia's future. And I note that in the concluding remarks of the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the alternative Prime Minister of Australia, that there wasn't a lot of positivity in those concluding remarks. Uh, can I say to the Leader of the Opposition uh, that we in the Parliament have a Member big obligation to set something of a tone for the country? And, uh, the Leader of the Opposition needs to go back to some basics, and we all need to draw a deep breath and recognise that Australia is a very great country. Um, we have a rational base to be optimistic about our future. Let's look at the strength of the economy, nearly 20 years of sustained economic growth. This is ultimately um, almost unmatched by any significant economy around the world. Low unemployment, low interest rates. Uh, these are extraordinary achievements, and also with a debt and deficit level which is the envy of the rest of the world. And I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, if you would like a debate at the National Press Club on debt and deficit levels, then, then I will name the date when we will have it. Uh, no, no, we'll name the date for the debate. Did everyone hear that? So we're going to be debating debt and deficit at the National Press Club. Order. I thank the Leader Order. of the Opposition Members for responding so positively to my challenge to debate policy options for Australia's future economy. Then you look at the remarkable strengths of uh, the Australian people themselves. You know, you travel around the world and you see that in Australia we have remarkable social solidarity. We are a multicultural miracle to the rest of the world, and as a result of which there is a huge dynamism in this country brought to our shores by successive waves of migrants over multiple decades, and we are proud inheritors of that. So we have a rational basis to be optimistic about our future. We have excellent relations with our neighbours. Our diplomatic relations with our neighbours in Southeast Asia, East Asia and the rest, and the rest of our wider region are in first-class working order. We have every basis for optimism for the future. But on top of that, I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition and those opposite that Australians by instinct are a positive people. We have always been that way. We have a can-do approach. We see a problem, we get up, we fix it, we move on. The whole culture of our country is a positive entrepreneurial country, and it is that sentiment which we on this side of the House intend to harness as we take the country forward. And Australians, in my experience in public life, disdain a culture of negativity. They disdain the negativity which, regrettably, has become characteristic of this place. And what I have said earlier in question time today is the easiest thing you can do in Australian national politics is to use negative invective. The hardest, thing you can do, the hardest thing you can do is to sit down, look at the facts, get brief, briefed on the facts, look at the policy options, look at evidence-based policy, and then make a decision and then implement it. And to make sure that what you've implemented is actually working, and if it's not, then reform it and change it. That's the way you do public policy. Doing that properly in a positive way takes time and mental effort. Engaging in the politics of invective and negativity, frankly, takes about a nanosecond of time. This is another 
reflection I would leave to he who would put himself forward as the alternative Prime Minister of Australia. The other thing that I'd say about our people, the Australian people, right across the vast land of ours, is how much we as a nation relish our unity as a people and how we instinctively revile against those who seek to divide us into one camp or another. And I would say again to the Leader of the Opposition that this Australian people want to see all sides of political debate work together for the nation's future. So that if you have a genuine contribution to what we do differently on the economy, on asylum seekers policy, on national security, on education, on health, on what we do with housing, on what we do with Indigenous policy, we'd like to hear about it. And that's why I said on the question of asylum seekers policy earlier today, if the Leader of the Opposition would simply do this, avail himself of the opportunity we in the government would happily accommodate to have himself fully briefed by the national security agencies on every aspect of the circumstances which our brave men and women in uniform in the Australian Navy every day confront on the high seas. Here, here. That's the responsible approach. Then, once you've been briefed on the facts, one of them, of course, is public, the attitude of the government of Indonesia, then come and talk to us about what you think we should be doing differently other than what we are. Because other than that, it is just pure old politics. Pure old politics. And for those who opposite who have uh, trumpeted the Howard solution, as it was back in those days, I'd say one thing. It was a staging post at Nauru, 70 per cent of whom all ended up back in good old Australia. An uncomfortable fact, but a fact nonetheless. And you know something? Facts tend to make our political opponents uncomfortable, because facts should form the basis of policy. So Australians would like us to be positive in this place. They have a disdain for the politics of negativity, and they also have a disdain for the politics of division and disunity. And there's one other thing I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition would, act, would, actually, I would actually ask to reflect on this. Those in the nation who observe the deliberations of the parliament would like us to show some basic civility to each other as well. Some basic civility. And I haven't seen a lot of that in evidence in recent times in this place. So these, I believe, are the sentiments and the attitudes which the Australian people bring to their expectations of how we as a parliament, how we as a national government and how yourselves as an alternative government behave in this place. Our view of political life, we in the Australian Labor Party, is about building the House up. We believe in building the House up, and it takes time, brick by brick laying the foundation, setting the walls, Men constructing the roof. Sense. That is how we see the task of nation building. That is how we see our mission in politics. There is an alternative approach to politics, which I've seen too much of from the Leader of the Opposition, unfortunately, which is how do you tear the House down? We build up the House. It seems, regrettably, that those opposite are more interested in tearing the place down. I could say to those opposite, by instinct, I and my colleagues, we are nation builders. We believe that the business of the nation and the business of the nation's government is to build roads, is to build rail, not to walk away from building rail, to build a first-class, world-class national broadband network, not to simply engage in the very cheap politics of scorn and derision, which is what we hear from those opposite. Can I say on top of that that when it comes to the foundations of the House, we on this side of the House have laid strong economic foundations for Australia's future. We have strong economic growth—2.5 per cent over the year to March, almost the highest across a troubled OECD, low unemployment—5.5 per cent. But here is the killer. Those opposite talk about mismanagement on the part of the government. We have added one million jobs almost to the national workforce. Order. One million jobs to the national workforce. But when Order. we say that, those opposite Member again Fadler resort to the old politics being of negativity and derision. outside of his place in this chamber. I also say to those opposite, in laying these strong economic foundations, we have also brought about low inflation at 2.5 per cent, well within the band set by the Reserve Bank and the regulators, and record low interest rates, strong public finances. I mentioned that during question time. AAA credit rating, productivity upswing, market sector labour market productivity up 2 per cent over the past year, though there is much still to be done with productivity in this country. Education. We have been rolling out the platform for an education revolution these last several years. Now, for those opposite, and I noticed some interjections just then, 
Do those Order. opposite oppose the 3,000 plus libraries we've built in the schools of Australia? Do they, do they oppose? Every time I have been to an opening, Order. I seem to have run into members of Her Majesty's most loyal opposition. And that's because they actually know in their heart of hearts it's a very good thing. I've never run into a PNC or PNF that when you run into when you're opening a school library, they say, we don't want this library. Okay. You know why? Because we want to build up the intellectual capital of the country. That is why we've also built two to three hundred trades training centres right across the country in, in Conservative-held electorates as well as Labor-held electorates, and for the Nats as well. Paul, good to see you up there, and I, I salute you for your career in this place. Can I say, um, can I say also? Can I say also, in laying the economic foundations? Members of Fadden, you're testing my patience. Can I say also, in laying the economic foundations, an education revolution which has now seen 190,000 more young people in universities than there were when we came to office. Why? We took a policy decision to uncap places so that more working families' kids could get to university. People who are qualified to go but under the previous regime couldn't find a place. So you're going to have more kids at university, more opportunities for those pursuing the trades through hundreds of trades training centres, wired libraries across the entire school system so our kids can be plugged into the best teaching facilities across the country. And then my colleague, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Infrastructure, laying out world-class infrastructure through a proper decision-making process called Infrastructure Australia for road, for rail, for port across the entire spectrum. Without basic economic infrastructure, the nation's economic fundamentals cannot be guaranteed. Which brings me, of course, to high-speed broadband. Broadband which will be world-class, 100 megabits plus per second, in order to plug us into the information economy of the 21st century. And as I said in question time earlier today, to make sure that our brothers and sisters in the bush are not disadvantaged. Here, here. Every Australian, rich or poor, country or city, with access to the information superhighway, if you're a small business oper operating out of Wangaratta, you've got as much opportunity to get your product or your service to market as you have if you're running a business in the central business district of Sydney. That's our belief in laying the foundations of the nation's house. We've also been in the business of constructing the walls. We have been pursuing a vigorous and strong foreign policy. We have, through both the Minister for Defence, who is now uh, retiring from politics, and also the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and also through the actions of multiple ministers, built the best set of bilateral relationships in Australia's region that we have had in this country's post-war history. That's just a fact. And we have been building a robust defence. We have major capital ships rolling off the, uh, rolling off the, uh, the production line. We have them about to join the ranks of the Australian Navy. And we have also, of course, been working to improve Emergency Management Australia. These are all about how we maintain the security of the House. We're building the walls to make sure that they, make, that they are robust against those threats which may come against us. Then, on top of that, we have been not just laying the foundations with the economy, not just building the walls in terms of security, but we are also, in completing the house, we're constructing a roof for the protection of all. And by doing that, we are making sure that those suffering from disabilities are properly cared for, so that all Australians can have proper protection should they suffer disability. Investing a billion dollars over four years to start rolling out the first stage of Disability Care Australia. Superannuation, raising the rate from 9 to 12 per cent. Pensions, 3.5 million pensioners, up to $207 a year, $207 a fortnight better off for singles, $236 better off for couples, the biggest pension increase in Australia's history. Health, we've invested $4.6 billion in dental care. We've invested some $16.4 billion in the hospital system. And for the information of the Leader of the Opposition, the level of federal funding of national expenditure on hospitals at the time at which the government of which he was a minister left office was 38.7 per cent. We are now on, on track to raise that to 50 per cent. There is a simple difference. Building a roof under which people can be protected should they fall ill. A $2.2 billion investment in mental health. Age care, a $3.7 billion reform package by the minister who's been responsible for that. And then in, beyond 
our task of laying the foundations, building the walls, constructing a roof for the protection of all, we have also been concerned about the environment beyond as well. We have acted on the environment. My colleague today referred to the achievements that we have delivered in the Murray-Darling Murray Basin Plan. This is the first time in the Federation's history that we have a plan to manage the most important ecosystem in the country's interior. I congratulate the minister for his work. It's a plan we took to the previous election in 2007. We've worked on it and done the hard policy work. We have acted on climate change. We have brought in a price on carbon. On top of that, we have also brought in a mandatory renewable energy target of 20 per cent. Australia's emissions are going down, and as a result of all that, we are ensuring that the environment surrounding the great house called Australia is properly protected. So I say to the Leader of the Opposition, as we enter this period leading up to the national election, our task in politics is to build a nation's house up, lay strong foundations in the economy, in education and in infrastructure build secure walls for our defence force and a strong foreign policy, construct a roof which protects all Australians when they get into strife, whether through disability or mental illness or other forms of illness, and to look after the environment as well. But I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition, regrettably he seems to scoff and mock throughout this entire presentation, I'd say to him this, his politics is about not building the house up. Regrettably, his comfort zone is tearing the house down. I welcome the debate I'll have with him at the National the Press Minister's Club soon. Prime Minister's time has expired, yeah. and I call the leader the opposite. Uh, 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 no, 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 leader of the opposition. Order, order. Leader of the opposition has the call. Name the date. Name the date. Name the date. Name the date. I didn't quite hear what you said, but I hope. Oh, well, I'm happy to repeat it. No, on well, indulgence. No. The, I, I did give you the call. I don't know where the microphone was on. On indulgence. Yeah. The, 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 I, I'm, ha I'm happy. I'm happy to have the election debate. The it, prime no, minister no, just no, needs to name the date. The well, no. leader of the opposition has the call. The uh, date. No, don't be no. scared. Why are you running scared? The deputy prime minister will resume his seat. Why are you running scared? <laughs> The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Member for Curtin, has the call. The Australian people awoke this morning to the news that, yet again, the Labor Party had sacked its leader, that, yet again, the Labor Party had changed the nation's leader, yet again, the Labor Party changed the head of government without so much as a fleeting concern for what the Australian people thought or who the Australian people wanted to lead the government. In fact, the Prime Minister has just spent 15 minutes telling us how wonderful everything is in his government. If that is the case, why is he refusing to explain the reason for sacking the former Prime Minister? Why has one third of the cabinet refused to serve under the current prime minister? If everything's fine <coughs> in the world of Labor, why have they sacked yet another leader, and why have 45 members voted against this prime minister? And why have a third of the cabinet refused to serve? The fact is, the fact is, Labor is using the office of prime minister as a weapon of retribution. They are using the office of Prime Minister to seek revenge for perceived past wrongs. They are using this office to get square with others because this is such a bitterly divided party. There is a civil war going on within the Labor Party. It is a bitter civil war and the conflict has not ended. In fact, the conflict is still writhing, it's still festering. And until such time as the Australian people have their say as to who should govern this country, the civil war could continue. And in fact, so dismissive is this party of the office of Prime Minister. They use it as just a cheap game of pass the parcel. It is the nation's highest elected office, and yet they're denying the Australian people the opportunity to have their say. All the while, while this civil war rages, 
The Australian people, their hopes, their dreams, their concerns, their needs are being ignored by this government. In question time, the Prime Minister was given many opportunities to explain why it is that they sacked yet another leader. And as ministers stood up to laud the achievements of this government, not one of them could explain why, if so much had been achieved, why they got rid of the leader who apparently achieved it. Just consumed by revenge, driven by personal hatred. And so there is a need, there is an urgent need for stability and order in government. We have to have confidence restored to consumers, to business, to investors. And the coalition is united. The coalition is ready to govern. The coalition can provide stable and certain and competent government. All we need is a date for the election. We have released a policy document, 52 pages, our plan for real solutions for all Australia, which contains a wealth of information on our policies, solutions to deliver a strong economy and a secure nation. But in contrast, whatever the Prime Minister tried to say, however he rehashed his old cliches and went through his old rehearsed lines, the failures of this <coughs> government are writ large. The budget deficits, as far as the eye can see, the steepest descent into debt of any country apart from perhaps Iceland. The mining tax, which makes us vulnerable to charges of international uncompetitiveness. The largest carbon tax in the world, which is driving up the cost of doing business in this country. And the greatest policy failure of a generation in border protection. We are a less secure nation. We are more vulnerable as a result of this government and these two past prime ministers. And nothing, nothing that this current prime minister can say, nothing he can promise now will change the fact that it was his handiwork that found a solution to border protection and the issue of asylum seekers and created a massive problem that's seen 45,000 people try to come to Australia via a revitalised people smuggling trade that has led to hundreds of deaths at sea and not one of this lot will take responsibility for it. Shame on you. A monumental policy failure and at the core of it is this current Prime Minister's work. Now, as the Leader of the Opposition has so rightly pointed out, and you can't argue with it, the government can't run on its first term agenda because they sacked Prime Minister Rudd for Prime Minister Gillard. The government can't run on its second term agenda because they sacked Prime Minister Gillard for Prime Minister Rudd. But what is so troubling about this latest debacle is that Australia once had a proud reputation for stable and orderly government, an international reputation that was admired by so many others, our predictability, our stability. You know, last night I received messages from my foreign policy contacts in governments across the globe who expressed their utter bewilderment by this turn of events. And the Prime Minister's refusal to confirm the election date and trying to weasel around when an election will be held is creating even more uncertainty. Now, some of those who are sitting in the chamber and some of those listening to this debate will remember the Prime Minister, sorry, the former Prime Minister, that's Gillard, not Rudd, not Gillard Rudd, the former Prime Minister's hand-picked foreign minister in Senator Carr. Remember his first press conference last year, the first of one of his many gaffes, when he was asked about a potential delay in Papua New Guinea's elections. You remember that? And in an extraordinary lapse of judgment, Senator Carr said that if Papua New Guinea were to delay its elections, even for a moment, he would have to mobilise the world opinion and isolate and condemn Papua New Guinea and impose sanctions on Papua New Guinea. Well, my colleagues won't be surprised to learn that some of my friends overseas have suggested to me that should Prime Minister Rudd seek to delay the election, then they'll have no alternative but to impose sanctions on Australia, isolate and condemn Australia for its failure to hold an election on time. 
Oh, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Meet your own standards that you set for others. And as President Udiono's spokesman said last night, this process of leadership change in Australia is beyond comprehension. Oh yes, foreign investors are baffled by this. Business is dismayed. There is a deep yearning for a clear and united plan to deliver a stronger Australia, stronger borders, a better future for all Australians. They want to hear a government get rid of the carbon tax that is driving jobs and business offshore, driving manufacturing offshore. They want to hear that a government will get rid of the mining tax, which is making our mining companies internationally uncompetitive. And in fact, I met with a number of mining sector people today. And they were telling me about their investments in other countries. And I said, but what about Australia? And they said, you must be joking. The instability that this government has provided, the massive increase in regulation, the massive increase in legislation, the massive increases in taxes, the duplication in approval processes is driving investment offshore, and it's certainly not attracting more foreign investment to this country. And that is why. That is why the coalition can provide strong, stable, competent, experienced government. The coalition is committed to restoring our international reputation, to reassure the world that order can be restored to government in this country. The anarchy in the Labor Party is not reflective of the will of the Australian people, and most certainly once the Prime Minister is honest with the Australian people and confirms the date, the Australian people have their say. In the area of international relations, I've outlined our policy position, our portfolio responsibilities, our approach in trade, in foreign affairs in some detail. And should we be elected, we will move quickly to repair the damage caused by bans on the live cattle trade, which took away Indonesia's trust and confidence in us to be a reliable trading partner. We will restore the standing of this country in the eyes of the international community. We will attract foreign investment to our shores. We will stand behind our mining and resource sector. We will build a stronger economy, and we will be a government Australia can be proud of. Yeah. Order. Call the member for Wakefield. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to rise to speak on this uh, matter of public importance. And you can tell that although circumstances change, the one thing that doesn't change in this country is the opposition's tactics. Not one iota. So what have we seen from them in this matter of public importance? Well, we've seen unrelenting negativity. Unrelenting negativity. They've got a, an MPI that talks about a clear and united plan, uh, a stronger Australia, a better future. But what did we hear from them? Unrelenting negativity. What did we hear from them? Dark partisanship. Dark partisanship. This sort of vicious, dark partisanship. What did we hear from them? What did we hear from them? Rank opportunism. Rank opportunism. And of course, it's because they've been the most disloyal opposition in the history of this country. The most disloyal opposition in the history of this country. Because what they've sought to do at every single opportunity is to divide the country along partisan lines for their own interests. Their own interests. The most disloyal, the most destructive opposition since Fraser. That is the truth of the matter. That is the truth of the matter. And so for them to come in here and talk about a better future and a stronger Australia and a clear and united plan, when all they offer to the Australian people is this unrelenting negativity, this dark partisanship, this rank opportunism, that's all they offer, the most disloyal opposition in the history of the country, seeking to divide at every single opportunity. And they come in here with their sort of you know, 53 pages of slogans. That's what they sort of think is a, a policy document, 53 pages of slogans, um, and think that, that, that the Australian people will fall for that. Well, we know that this has been their modus operandi. We know that even though circumstances don't change, uh, have changed, their tactics haven't. They've been running around this country talking the country's economy down, undermining confidence, damaging jobs. And we know that if we had adopted the policies that they advocated during the global financial crisis, 
that 200,000 jobs would have been lost in this country. We would have had a recession, just like the rest of the world. Just like the rest of the world, and we know what the opposition leader was doing when the great debates on uh, the stimulus package were going on. Uh, he was absent for a number of votes. We know that. We know that. It's on the record of the parliament, uh, and some of us know why, of course. But the thing about it is, they've been missing from votes. They've been, and when they have engaged in the debate, unrelenting negativity, uh, undermining economic confidence. And we know that if we embark on the policies that they had advocated at the time and they advocate in the future, that is, the policies of economic austerity, we know where that will leave the nation. Now, we know where the politics of uh, the economics of austerity uh, took the rest of the world. It gave the United States of America a recession that is too, is, is, has been so serious that it has been labelled the Great Recession. The Great Recession. That's what the Americans call it, the Great Recession, second only to the Great Depression. We know that we've had a double dip and all very almost a triple dip recession in the United Kingdom. They adopted the policies that are advocated by this disloyal opposition. They have, they've, they've adopted it over there. Prime Minister Cameron, a Conservative, double dip recession. And they missed a triple dip recession by this much. By this much. And who suffers? Mature age workers, young workers, they're the people who are thrown on the scrap heap of unemployment, a whole generation of young people around the world suffering the effects of unemployment. A, Euro a recession in Europe which has been so serious, so serious that it has disabled the, the economies of the whole world. And we've seen places in Spain which have extraordinary levels of unemployment, extraordinary levels of unemployment that have not been seen since the, since the, the Great Depression. And we know that the global financial crisis, which ripped away 1 per cent of world economic growth, there was, there was very few countries that avoided that whirlwind, and Australia was one of them. And it was because of the actions of the member for Lilly and the member for Griffith and the Cabinet, who made clear and decisive um, policies to combat that, to avoid it, to protect Australia. And we know that the alternative to that, the opposition, would have plunged Australia into recession. We know what they want to do on industrial relations. Work choices will always be in their DNA, and we know that whatever they promise, it will just be the first wave of many waves. It will be the, you know, um, uh, the first of many things that they try and do in industrial relations. Uh, they've shied away from it because they think they might lose a vote or two here or there if they're honest about their intentions in that area. We know in climate change they have been in deep denial about the problem. They are part of the Flat Earth Brigade that uh, President Obama referred to. They are funded by the Flat Earth Brigade. Their branch membership is the Flat Earth Brigade. And the hysterical claims and the hysterical uh, sort of opposition of people like uh, Barnaby Joyce, Senator Joyce, a person who's seeking to join this House, running around the country telling us that we'll have $100 lamb roasts, that Australians will never eat lamb again, uh, when we saw the Leader of the Opposition say that Wyala would be wiped off the map, a town that I can assure him as a South Australian is still there, still going strong. So while we were acting, while we were making tough decisions, and they, are, they were tough decisions for this country, they have been playing politics with climate change. First, first under their previous opposition leader, the member for Wentworth, combining with the Greens to, uh, to block uh, the emissions trading system uh, in the Senate. Uh, we know that they're now committed uh, to a policy of ripping away the, the institutional frameworks which will help reduce emissions in this country. They want to rip those away and replace it with a system where we give taxpayers' money to big companies as some sort of incentive to stop polluting. I mean, it is a ridiculous policy. It is a ridiculous policy. And in doing so, in doing these things, I mean, it sounds, they're great slogans, but once they're put to the test, they don't make it. They don't make it because what this will do is make us a pariah in the world at a time when everybody else is acting on climate change. The Americans are acting on climate change. Prime Minister, uh, uh, President Obama, making a very, very serious uh, statement on that. The, the state of California enacting uh, uh, an emissions trading system. Parts of China doing the same. Europe, of course. Uh, has got an emissions trading system. So just as, uh, as the rest of the world is, is starting to come to grips with, with what is a very complex global problem, 
What is the opposition doing? Ripping it all up, making us a pariah in the world. We have seen their dark partisanship in, in, in the area of asylum seekers, and you saw it today in this debate, using people's fear to harvest votes, and complaining and complaining and complaining, lauding Prime Minister Howard for solving a problem that, he, that actually occurred on his watch—9,000 people came here on his watch. The difference between Prime Minister Howard and the Prime Ministers in this era is that the opposition in, in Prime Minister Howard's era actually backed him, actually backed him, gave the, gave the government the ability to act. What has this opposition done? Well, after complaining for so long, after complaining for so long, when they were given a bit of legislation to send uh, uh, asylum seekers who, are, who have arrived through irregular maritime arrivals in this country to send them to Malaysia, and what did they do? They came into this house and voted with the Greens to stop it, to prevent the government from enacting its program. They went into the Senate and voted with the Greens to prevent the government from enacting its system. They just want to create a problem because they, fear that they, they feed on the vote harvest that comes from it. Now We know that that is um, their intention at every opp opportunity. Dark partisanship, op opp opportunism, uh, uh, this relentless uh, negativity and this attempt to divide the country. Now, this next election is going to be about the future and it's going to be about fairness. It's about securing the economy in what are still tough economic times. And you only have to look at Europe or China or the United States of America or the United Kingdom to know that we are going through a major, majorly difficult time in terms of the world economy. So we are all about securing our domestic economy during that period. And we know that, that the Labor Party has got the runs on the board because we secured the Australian economy during the global financial crisis, and our economy is now 13 per cent bigger, 13 per cent bigger than it was prior to the global financial crisis. And every time you grow your economy, you grow your ability to service your debt. And the reverse is true too. If you shrink your economy through the politics of, uh, through the economics of austerity, you shrink your capacity to deal with debt. You shrink your capacity to keep people employed. You shrink your capacity, um, uh, your national productivity, uh, produ productivity agenda. So we know, we know that securing the economy is the most important thing to do. Labor has always been focused on the jobs of working Australians. We think that this election will be about the future and it will be about fairness and it will be won by the Australian Labor Party. Order, I call the, the honourable member for Sturt and the <coughs> leader of opposition business in the House. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Listening to the Prime Minister on his uh, matter of public importance today, you could be forgiven for thinking that Rip Van Winkle had woken from a three-year and three-day long sleep. Listening to the new Prime Minister speaking today, you could assume that three years and three days ago time stopped, and nothing has happened since that time that anybody in Australia is allowed to remember, because Rip has woken from his very long sleep and all the apparent achievements that he's outlined today all occurred because of something linked to Rip Van Winkle, who's awoken from this deep sleep. The, the Prime Minister singularly failed in his address today to explain why the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, had to be executed politically last night in this place. Listening to the, to the new Prime Minister, you would think that we lived in a land of, of chocolates and roses, of wine and caring, and that in fact three years and three days ago time stopped on his watch and now he's been restored to his rightful place. Mr Smug is back and writ large a condescending, patronising, uh, smug, supercilious, sanctimonious, self-regarding new Prime Minister. That is who we now have as Prime Minister. And we did not interrupt Mark anybody Mr. else. Mr. Why will then? resume his seat. The Parliamentary Secretary on a point of order. A point of order. Firstly, I would uh, like Speaker to be referred to by my correct title. Yeah. And secondly, I believe the member should withdraw in relation to the comments he made on, about the Prime Minister. Well, well, as I didn't, as as I didn't hear them, and for the sake of the good of the parliament, to which I think the member for Sturt 
would appear he should withdraw. Well, I'm, I'm shocked, but I withdraw. Thank you. Uh, I'm shocked that to, to call somebody self-indulgent and self-regarding is unparliamentary. But as we are in the dying days of this dishonourable, horrible, low parliament, which sunk to a new low last night when the Prime Minister was put to the political sword without explanation, I withdraw for the good of the House. Madam Speaker, what we've seen in the last 24 hours is the most extraordinary display of delusion from our new Prime Minister. He says that there can't be any negative politics. No negative politics. This is the man who sent out an email today saying negative personal politics has done much to bring dishonour to our parliament. Well, someone needs to tell the member for Hunter, Madam Speaker, or the member for Reid, or the member for Barton, or the member for McMahon, or Chifley, or Corangamite, all of these members that have been sent out like a pack of wolves for three years and three days to tear the member for Lawler down. She was never given a chance, Madam Speaker. She was never given a chance. And I'll admire one thing about the member for Lawler. She was tough. But even she couldn't be taught, she couldn't withstand the dogs of war that the member, the new Prime Minister, sent out against her three years and three days ago. Who can forget his teary farewell? His teary farewell in the Prime Minister's courtyard. Butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. He was shocked and amazed that he had been removed from the Prime Ministership. Today he's back, smug and as self-regarding as ever, and wanting everybody to put out of their minds like a bad dream the last three years and three days. Well, I felt sorry for the Prime Minister today, Madam Speaker. I even smiled at her in the chamber in the dying days of this parliament, and I said, what went wrong? Because listening to the new Prime Minister, you would think she had led a great government that had made terrific achievements, forgotten all the terrible disasters of the last three years, and offering no explanation as to why apparently this great Prime Minister who led a great government had to be torn down by the pack of wolves that he sent out to relentlessly and negatively campaign against her. All the headlines in the newspapers, all the leaking of polling that was done to destroy the former Prime Minister was orchestrated by Kevin Rudd and his supporters. The Sen Senator Carr from the Senate, Senator Kim Carr, I should say, rather than Senator Bob Carr, one of the henchmen that was used to destroy, to destroy Prime Minister Gillard. But Mr Rudd wants us all to forget these uh, three years of relentlessly, negatively, personally denigrating and destroying the Prime Minister. All the terrible stories that were leaked to the tabloid press about the Prime Minister's partner, none of them could have been known by the opposition, none of them could have been known by us. They were all known by now, members of her caucus. M the member for Sturt. Now I understand that MPIs are far-reaching. They're very far-reaching, Madam but Speaker. But this is overstretching the bounds of reach today, and I'd really be happy if we could maybe mention something to do with the MPI. Well, the MPI is how, the how Australia needs a strong and stable government, and the first thing to deliver a strong and stable government is to explain to the Australian people why a Prime Minister had to be torn down by Kevin Rudd and his henchmen. And the second way to deliver a stable country, Madam Speaker, is to name a date for the election. One of the big stories today is that the Prime Minister is trying to slide away, like the snake in the grass that he is, from the election on September the 14th. I withdraw. withdraw. I withdraw, Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister wants to avoid, at all costs, an election on September the 14th. He wants to leave the date open. The people of Australia want an election. They demand a change. The people of Australia want to put this horrible parliament behind them to elect a new government. And I'm sure the, member, the Minister for Health would agree with much of what I said because she was loyal to the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, to the end. She wasn't one of the henchmen sent out to tear down the Prime Minister, unlike the, the member for Hunter and his coterie of people. Who tangled web? Who weaved a very tangled web, Madam Speaker? Question that the House do now adjourn.